right, so what we need to do today is I'm going to skip some of the things on uh, dimensionality reduction. And there were uh, a number of topics on uh, nonlinear uh, models. Uh, so maybe we will come back to these topics uh, at the end of the semester. So what I wanted to do is I want to give you uh, a very brief uh, uh, overview of general methods. And because we discuss about principal component analysis, uh, a natural application will be to do kernel principal component analysis. So hopefully if we have time, we will cover that topic uh, today. Um, all right. So let me remind you, right? Uh, I want you to think of uh, how we did regression models, right? We postulated some regression function, and the regression function had some unknown parameters W, and then what we did is either we computed a point estimate of W, like a map estimate, or you know we computed the whole posterior distribution. So uh, everything, you know, once we compute, let's say, the posterior distribution, we can disregard all the data that we use for training. We don't need them anymore because all the information is contained on this posterior uh, P of W given uh, X and T. So what I'm going to do today is to uh, address some methods where actually we don't disregard the training data, but we use them to do predictions. And uh, you can start imagining in some uh, elementary way that effectively what these kernels that we will introduce are going to be will be some uh, function like some Gaussians, if you like, on the drop of the training data points, and somehow we will uh, be making predictions uh, using a weighted average of the training responses, something like that. All right? You know, so you will look at your neighbors, and with some weights defined by these functions that they are centered on each training point, you are going to be averaging and say I'm 0.5 of this and. 0.3 of this and 0.2 of that. So the idea here is we're not going to get rid of the training data. We're going to actually use them for predictions. But we need to see, is this worth doing? Uh, does it have any uh, positive things? Uh, uh, or it's just a mathematical exercise? And how do we do it formally? So uh, I remind you, uh, we already have seen techniques, actually, where we don't get rid of the training data. And the one that comes to my mind, that for sure we have done it, when we discussed the k-nearest neighbor uh, type of classifier, you remember how we classify a point? We look at the k-neighbors, which means we kept the neighbors. Because we assigned, basically, uh, when we wanted to do prediction for a point, we assigned the labels of the nearest neighbor out of the training data set. All right, so we have done that in, in principle, so we'd like to extend this idea. And by the way, uh, when I come back, maybe we will do this application as well to do density estimation. Uh, the ideas are very similar. Uh, we can uh, utilize the data to do that. All right, so let me uh, formally introduce what uh, kernels are. Uh, I'm going to give you only the very basics so I can uh, at least do one full application. So we're going to define, so if we have two points, x and x prime, and uh, if you think in the context of regression, this can be uh, the input variables. So a kernel uh, is uh, a function of x and x prime. Uh, we assume that it's non-negative, okay? So it's greater or equal to zero. We're assuming that it's symmetric. And I want you to think of the kernel measuring, in some ways, the similarities uh, of x and x prime. Or actually, you know, if you think of a regression problem, maybe the similarities in the context of the responses uh, at the input points in x and x prime. So if you're doing regression and you're predicting, let's say, the y's, this would be telling you, you know, how the points uh, that are close, let's say, in the input space, how they correlate to each other in in the response space, okay? But it is a measure of similarity, and uh, the key properties would be they are symmetric and, uh, uh, and non-negative. So uh, I'm gonna, you know, I want you to think right now that all of these kernels really have the form of an inner product. And what I mean in an inner product, uh, I'm writing this in a very general form. If you think 
but somehow you don't work in SpaceX, but you work in some future space, V of X. So this kernel is basically written as P transpose uh, phi, right? Phi of X transpose V of X prime, okay? So they basically have the form of a linear product, and the most common of them you can affiliate with would be to use a linear kernel that is X transpose X prime, okay? Where V of X is equal to X. Now, uh, here is the major idea here that uh, we would see in action hopefully today is what is called the kernel trick. What is the kernel trick? If you develop an algorithm to do some inference, some predictions, and that algorithm involves some inner products of the axis, you can actually substitute those inner products with uh, practically every, any kernel uh, including kernels that are defined by some affix uh, phi of x. So if you see a kernel somewhere, if you see a scalar product, you can replace that scalar product with any other choice of kernel. So that way you can come up with as many algorithms as you want. And the idea would be to develop some algorithms that somehow don't require to evaluate what phi of x is at all, uh, and they operate directly uh, using the kernel kx x prime. Okay? Uh, so that's a very powerful idea and we would like to see how that comes to play a role. So let me uh, give you some uh, examples first. So this is sort of the, uh, the generic uh, inner product definition. Um, this is the linear kernel. This is a stationary kernel uh, invariant to translations in uh, x. This is a homogeneous kernel, it depends only on uh, the distances uh, between x and x prime. Uh, and you know you can uh, think of this, affiliate this with uh, radial basis functions. Uh, I haven't said anything by the way that these distances are Euclidean distances. So this x and x prime can be documents and this can be an appropriate uh, uh, norm that defines the distance between two documents. Uh, x and x prime actually can be uh, in probability space and you can uh, come up with different sort of uh, uh, definitions there. All right, so let me uh, uh, see how we can actually go from the standard way we used to do regression to a, a, a formalism where we can do regression with, uh, with kernels. So I'm going to do the simplest uh, possible uh, model that we saw in the context of regression without uh, any probabilities. So you remember we had the regression function, all right? W transpose phi of x, okay? Uh, Tn is the training data, the training responses, and uh, we wanted to compute the Ws, this uh, coefficients in the regression function, so that we minimize the training error, and we put some regularizer loss, right? This is how we came with the map test. So uh, when uh, you take derivatives with respect to W, all right, what you get is, uh, this is a standard result from things we have done before, right? Uh, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this equation for W, that's the old way of doing things. I'm gonna rewrite this as, I'm gonna call this big uh, minus one over lambda times this parenthesis, I'm gonna call it AN, and I'm going to write it as, as an phi of xn. So this way you can see that somehow we have been able to write w in terms uh, of the basis functions computed at the training inputs. And if I write this in a matrix form, uh, this is uh, phi transpose a. We haven't really done anything yet because you can see a involves a w there, right? So. Uh, but somehow we have written here uh, the W to be phi transpose A, and I remind you, uh, uh, you're going to see this explicitly on the next uh, slide. Phi is the design uh, matrix, but defined in the space phi, in the future space. Okay? All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, you know, I have W to be phi transpose A. So I'm going to go on this. Uh, uh, error function if you like, and I'm going to substitute what I see W, I'm going to substitute with phi transpose A. Just algebra, okay? So I see here W transpose would be A transpose phi times V of Xn minus Tn, and then 
W transpose, so I have A transpose V, V transpose A. You expand the square there, and uh, you, this is what you get. Okay? And uh, I remind you uh, the matrix V, how it looks. All right? Uh, so, uh, easy, easy to remember, right? Every row is one data point, okay? Every column corresponds to one basis function evaluated at all data points. And some formulas uh, here, phi transpose phi is uh, this vector phi, okay? Phi transpose and uh, similar, just uh, 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 playing with linear algebra. Okay, uh, so I'm going to introduce now uh, the gram matrix K, which has dimension n by n, and I'm going to introduce it by defining it as phi of x n transpose phi of x n. Right? This is a definition. I'm going to define a matrix K that has dimension n by n. Right? You can see because I have n training points, so the dimension here would be n by n uh, as phi transpose phi. And if you want to write this in a matrix form, it's really nothing else but k equal phi, phi transpose. You can see this explicitly. Phi transpose is like that, right? Uh, this is for each training point, and, uh, uh, and phi transpose like that. So you can see is phi transpose x1, phi x1, phi transpose x1, phi x2, etc. Okay? So we define this. Uh, and um, we come back to this equation and we substitute that k equal phi phi transpose. So I see a k there, I see a k there, I see a k there, I see another k. So the cost function becomes like this. And you notice the only unknown in that cost function now is a. There is no w. And what's the dimensionality of a? Let's go back. What's the dimensionality? Remember how we define A? What's the dimensionality of A? It's as many as the data points. And what was the dimensionality of W? It was, you know, uh, when we were doing the regression problems, that say it was uh, uh, M or something, you know, uh, something else, okay? Uh, but this is equal to the number of training uh, data points, okay? So, uh, if you take derivatives with respect to alpha and you set them equal to zero, uh, you basically have a direct equation for uh, computing A, and it says A is equal this inverse matrix times the uh, target vectors in the training data set. And this matrix, you agree with me, is of what dimension? It's n by n. When we computed W, let's say a point estimate of W, what was the dimension, what uh, matrix we had to invert? n by n, let's say, if you have a good dimensionality of w, right? So here it is n by n, okay? And uh, if you try to do predictions, now the question is, uh, well, before I, we do predictions, notice that in computing uh, uh, A, we don't really need to know the basis functions anymore. Because K contains the kernel values. Which means even if you started with some basis functions, you can get rid of everything and substitute the inner product of the basis functions with this kernel, and, and the only thing you need to know is the kernel. So you can even substitute that kernel for something else, this will still work, okay? The question is, can I do the same idea when I do predictions? Well, luckily, yes, because when you do predictions, right, the regression function is W transpose phi, so if you substitute W with uh, A transpose capital Phi, right? This is what we computed from uh, the optimization. Uh, this is what uh, you know we had before. So uh, I'm writing the transpose of this Phi transpose, Phi capital transpose A. And notice now, uh, Phi transpose, Phi capital transpose, it's really Phi compute the text transpose Phi of X1, Phi of X transpose, Phi of X2. So really, this whole thing it only requires to evaluate the kernel at x with respect to each of the training data points x1 to xn. You see that? There is no calculation anymore that requires basis functions because to do predictions, this, uh, this k here that you see is a vector now. All right? This k is just a, a scalar. So this vector is defined it, uh, between 
the distances of x and the training inputs x1 to xn. Okay? So if you want for a new x to predict what the response of the regression model is, you have to compute, of course, this matrix, and that matrix, we said, it only involves the kernels, and then you have to compute this kernel vector that only has the kernel values. So there is absolutely no need anymore to, to we don't solve any m by m uh, inversion problem the way we used to. That's why we call this the dual problem. Uh, so we have to invert an m by m matrix, all right? And predictions uh, require basically multiplications of the order of m. Uh, now, of course, you know, if uh, n is way bigger than uh, m, you may wonder why bother, all right? And sometimes the answer to why bother is because uh, it sounds interesting, right? It doesn't have everything to be useful. It seems you can generalize to a lot of very interesting things. And who knows? I mean, okay, this is the case when n is greater than m. How about uh, uh, if uh, m, n is much less than m, right? That can be a very useful case uh, uh, as well. Uh, all right, so, uh, so the cost basically of computations uh, goes to, uh, of the order of n cubed, right? That's what we invert versus what we have done before, which is of the order of uh, m cubed. Uh, okay, I'm going to bypass this. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the, uh, uh, the architecture, no, no, not the architecture, but you know, the design of kernels, right? So there are infinite kernels, and for every uh, uh, kernel that I give you, you can actually construct as many other kernels as you wish. So there is uh, uh, an infinite setting of uh, uh, design of kernels. So here are some examples. Uh, I am going to introduce, you know, pictures showing you kernels through basis functions, but I want you to uh, realize that eventually we don't need basis functions to define kernels, right? And I will talk about this explicitly, but I give you now how some kernels, you can derive them from basis functions and see how they look like. So in this case, if the basis functions are polynomials that we see here, uh, this is how the kernel looks at, you know, I fixed the location x prime, and you can see uh, how the kernel looks like, right? Uh, so again, you can think of this as a measure of how things uh, x and x prime are uh, uh, correlated, if you like. Uh, okay, so this kernel looks like that from polynomial basis functions. If the basis functions are Gaussians, the kernel at the given location at x prime equal to zero looks like, uh, like Gaussian. It is a Gaussian. Uh, if you take sigmoid basis functions, the kernel looks like that at x prime equal to zero as a function of x. Okay, and uh, but you can go way above. Uh, you know, using basis functions, right? So in principle, we said anything that uh, uh, is uh, symmetric and uh, positive definite sort of should lead to acceptable kernels. So here's an example. If you have two vectors of x and z, uh, if you take x transpose z squared, that's an acceptable kernel. And uh, uh, you can always think, you know, if it's an acceptable kernel, you should be able to write it as an inner product in some future space. And indeed, if you expand x and z, right, you take the square, you can see that uh, the future space is what you see here. Right? Can you see that? I mean, if you take this transpose that, you will get x1 squared times z1 squared is from that, x2 squared, z2 squared, and then 2 times x1, x2, z1, z2. Okay? So, uh, uh, but of course, this is uh, time consuming and it's not necessary to do, right? Uh, so, uh, what you see at the bottom, if you have basically uh, uh, a, a kernel that is symmetric and positive, uh, or you know, non negative basically, so the gram matrix is uh, semi positive definite, uh, this is all that we would need for uh, the type of applications we do. So this is a very nice uh, summary from uh, Bishop's book that shows you uh, rules for constructing your own kernels. And uh, maybe you should take the time and actually try to prove some of this. So let's see. 
If I give you a kernel, an acceptable kernel K1, and another acceptable kernel K2, all of these are valid kernels. So C times K1 is a valid kernel if C is positive. Can you see that? I mean, give me a reason based on everything we have said. Why, if K1 is a valid kernel, why C, K1 is a valid kernel for C positive? And again, you can think, can you write this as an inner product or something like that, conceptually? I mean, if you think that, uh, so K1 uh, can be written as phi, phi transpose, right? Uh, so what about K then? What the future space would be if I try to put K as some inner product? Would be square root of C times the future space of the capital uh, K1, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, another equation. If you have, uh, let's see, if you have any arbitrary function f of x, it doesn't say positive. Any arbitrary function, I trust whatever it says there, right, has to be right. So if I have any arbitrary function f of x, and, I, and k1 is a valid kernel, then f of x, k1, f of x prime is a valid kernel. Can you see that? So what would be the future space for this kernel if we knew the future space for k1? f of x times uh, p, of, uh, p of x, okay? And there's no reason, uh, uh, there's no requirement for f to be positive or anything like that. Okay, so if you take a function q that is a polynomial here with positive coefficients, and uh, you put in uh, q of x, you substitute basically with uh, a valid kernel, then this becomes to be a valid kernel. Uh, adding kernels is a valid kernel. Uh, if you have uh, uh, a positive definite matrix A, x transpose A, x prime is uh, a valid kernel. If you multiply two kernels, if you add them, you know, uh, you will need to use this if you try to, to do design of uh, uh, kernels for your application. So, you can come back to this. Okay. Um, so let me give you the, the very standard uh, uh, kernel that you will see in the literature, especially when you work with Gaussian processes, something we will cover uh, before the end of the semester. So this is the square exponential kernel or Gaussian kernel. Um, and uh, uh, obviously you recognize the Gaussian there. So if you write, if sigma is diagonal and you write it like that, uh, this takes uh, the form that uh, we will see actually in the, uh, maybe you know in the, in the next lecture possibly or the two lectures from now. This is uh, what is called the uh, uh, ARD kernel, or ARD st st uh, stands for automatic relevance determination, because you can see from this when uh, for a particular direction when sigma j goes to infinity. Uh, that direction doesn't play any role in the kernel, right? So, so effectively, you do future selection, you say that dimension is unimportant, okay? And uh, uh, obviously, when you uh, do kernel design, right, especially when we do Gaussian processes, uh, you will have obviously a choice to say, use whatever you want, let's say, for sigma j squared here, but as we will find out, Actually, once you select it, you say I'm going to use a square exponential kernel, you're going to go and have to compute these parameters by doing some optimization problem, maximizing some marginal likelihood uh, the way we have done earlier uh, in the course. Okay? So I want you to not pre assume that somehow you have to bother and select on your own what these parameters are, because how do you know how the data are correlated, right? I mean, this is what you try to find out. So, yes, you assume that uh, you have a Gaussian kernel, but everything else has to be learned. All right. Uh, uh, here is sort of an interesting uh, thing that we need to uh, start uh, wondering about. If you have a, a, this uh, square exponential kernel, the Gaussian kernel, 
all right? So what I, I am writing here this in the generic form, okay, this is a Euclidean distance. So if you expand this, all right, um, I can rewrite it as um, uh, this function here from the first term, uh, this function there from the second term, and then this kernel on the middle. And you remember we said if uh, k1 is a valid kernel and you have any arbitrary function f, this is also a valid kernel. Uh, can now you see? Can you see why this is a valid kernel? If you want to write this in a, as an inner product, k1, uh, what would be the basis function? The, the future space uh, uh, phi of x to write this as an inner product, or at least what the dimensionality would be of phi of x uh, to write this as an inner product, the, the exponential on the middle. Well, it says there, right? If you expand this in, uh, uh, you know, Taylor series expansion, uh, you will get uh, powers basically of x transpose x prime. And I forgot because I noticed I, I bypassed it on a few slides before. These powers of x transpose x prime, they are also valid kernels, right? So effectively here, the dimensionality of this kernel will be infinite because you will, uh, p of x will be infinite dimensional. So when you work with kernels, the implicit future space implied by the kernel can be infinite dimensional. And in most cases, infinite dimensional. All right, so in some sense, this is good because if you have something that's infinite dimensional, you can do lots of interesting things in infinite dimensions, right? You increase the complexity of the problem on the other hand, you may wonder, do I have to uh, invert any matrices in infinite dimensions? How does the algebra going to come? Uh, obviously, from what we saw with the regression problem before, uh, everything we would need to invert would be of the order of n by n matrices, right? And uh, the infinite dimensionality will not uh, affect us at all. Okay. Uh, Let's make things a little bit more weird. So this was the square exponential kernel, right? I, I wrote the x minus x prime square uh, explicitly. If you look carefully here, every term looks like a kernel term to me, does it? I mean, obviously, this is the kernel between x and x, right? This x prime, x prime, x and x prime. And you know what? If I use the kernel trick, I can actually substitute each of these exponential, each of these terms in the exponential with some other kernel. And the result will also be a valid kernel. Can I do that? That's the kernel trick. So you can substitute this with something else. And then you have uh, a Gaussian looking kernel, but uh, things inside the kernel uh, are, you know, are uh, other kernels. And that way, actually, you can have uh, a Gaussian kernel of a Gaussian kernel and uh, those type of things are used a lot lately to test algorithms to see if uh, uh, you know if your algorithm is actually sophisticated enough to work with uh, this work type of uh, of, uh, of data. Okay, so if you uh, check papers on Gaussian processes, you will see this is not weird. It's a very common type of uh, uh, practice in uh, testing algorithms. All right, so I'm going to bypass this for, uh, for now. Uh, all right, so uh, let me summarize. I mentioned that we do not need to play with uh, the future space, right? Uh, the only thing we need is to have uh, this uh, uh, gram matrix K of dimensions n by n. Uh, if this matrix is semi-positive uh, definite, uh, uh, this is all we need to do our calculations. Now, out of curiosity, so uh, if you have uh, this uh, a kernel matrix defined like that, right? This kernel is called the Mercer kernel. And uh, uh, the only thing you may wonder if there is a kernel, like if I give you a matrix like that with the semi positive definite, do you actually have an explicit description of the future space defined by this kernel? So the answer is yes. All right, even though we never need it. So if, uh, 
Uh, this matrix is semi-mostly definite. Uh, you can do an eigen decomposition and you can write K as uh, U transpose on U, all right? And uh, explicitly, you can see that the basis functions for each point Xi is lambda transpose uh, each of the columns of the matrix U, okay? So by doing an eigen decomposition of K, you can actually identify explicitly what the future uh, map is and you can explicitly write each component of this uh, uh, kernel matrix as an inner product of phi transpose x, you know, phi of x prime. Again, we will not need this, but the idea is if you have uh, uh, a valid kernel matrix, there is an underlying future space, okay? And, and uh, you can write it explicitly by using the eigen decomposition of k. All right, uh, there are some kernels that they are extremely useful in uh, uh, practice and uh, some of them, they are not Mercer kernels, all right? And, and I, I, you can see uh, on the bottom there, when you use this hyperbolic tangent-based uh, kernel, this is very common type of thing in, uh, in neural networks. This kernel, when you form the Gramian, basically, the matrix is not uh, positive definite, so this is not a valid kernel, but it's used a lot in, uh, in applications uh, uh, for other reasons that we may discuss when uh, we talk later on uh, for Ga on Gaussian processes. Uh, but remember, this kernel does not lead to semi-positive uh, 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 Gramian metrics. OK. Uh, so do we suppose to finish at 12.15? Remind me. 12.20, okay. So in three minutes, I'm going to have to switch uh, to give you the kernel PCA uh, uh, model today. So let me uh, discuss a little bit about the Fisher kernel. So imagine that you have a generative uh, model with some parameters theta from where you can take uh, samples of uh, X. And you want to find the kernel that measures the similarities of uh, two data points sampled basically from this distribution, let's say data point X and X prime. And the way to do this is defining what's called the Fisher score, right? So the Fisher score is basically uh, the gradients with respect to theta uh, of the log of P of X. And the Fisher kernel, this is definition, is G transpose F inverse uh, G, computer at X and X prime correspondingly, where F is the Fisher information matrix, which is the expectation with respect to the distribution of X of G, G transpose. There's a lot there, right? So obviously this looks like an information theoretic uh, uh, motivated uh, measure of uh, uh, similarities between X and X prime. It involves the Fisher scores. Uh, we may have seen this before uh, because they appear uh, all over the place. And uh, I believe we have seen the Fisher information methods before as well, okay? so. Uh, the nice thing with this uh, type of uh, Fisher kernel is if you go and you change the parameterization of theta and you uh, go to something else through some function psi, uh, the, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, the kernel basically remains invariant. It doesn't change the parameterization. Uh, if you approximate, so the Fisher information is an expectation over the distribution of x. So if you take samples from the distribution and you approximate this, with the sample average, uh, then uh, it comes out that actually the kernel is nothing else but corresponds to widening of these uh, uh, Fisher scores G. Okay, so it's like doing widening of, of the Fisher scores. Uh, if you apply this uh, uh, kernel, to, just to give you a sense, to the Gaussian distribution, and you do the algebra, there is really nothing. You know, the scores come to be. Uh, uh, S is, is the covariance, so the scores come to be S minus 1, X minus mu. Uh, the Fisher information matrix comes to be S minus 1. And when you plug in everything on K, the, the, uh, the kernel comes to be the Maharanov's distance, that is the distance measured basically uh, in the exponential of the multivariate Gaussian distribution, with S being the covariance matrix. So again, somehow, uh, you know, uh, 
seems come from nowhere to be related uh, to each other. Uh, if you're interested for a, an interpretation on a, on a geometric sense of what the physical one is about, please read slide uh, 46. Uh, since I told you I would have to move uh, uh, to Journal PCA uh, when the, the clock hits 12.05. So let me see what slide we are. I mean, I think it would be appropriate to do kernel PCA now because uh, we discuss about PCA and things would be hopefully fresh in your mind. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what is the objective here? I'm going to try, there's a lot of things in the slides. Uh, I'm going to try to be very brief and uh, as concise as possible in 10 minutes. So we're going to try to rewrite the whole PCA algorithm, and I'm going to do the non-probabilistic version uh, in a way that involves inner products between the axes. And the idea then would take to take the inner products and substitute them with a the kernel, all right? And you see what that means. So obviously, a kernel implies that somehow we're going to be mapping things to some future space, but we don't really want to compute any future space, all right? We don't want to do that. So I remind you what uh, the, uh, the standard PCA was, you know, assuming the data are uh, centered, okay? So I'm writing the sample covariance like this, so the mean has already been subtracted from this axis. So effectively what we need to do is, we need to solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the sample covariance, okay? And, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, I was trying to change a lot of the notation, right? So, uh, this is what, uh, 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 well, I think we use M. Uh, I think I have to change this notation here. All right, so basically what we would like to do is, we would like somehow to, uh, to operate in some future space implied by uh, some kernel. So let me explain uh, uh, first graphically and then maybe we can get the idea. Imagine you have, uh, you start X, we discuss about how to do principal component analysis, working directly in uh, the X space, forming the sample covariance. So now let's do the, the following weird thing. Let's map X to some future phi of X, and let's do linear PCA in the future space phi of X. Right? I mean, you map X to phi of X, and uh, you forget that you even start from X and you say, I'm going to do linear PCA in the space phi of X. So this is what you see here. And this is, you map the axis to a phi of X space. From 2D, you go to another 2D, you know, this is phi of X. And this is uh, the first principal component doing standard PCA, but in the future space. And these lines that you see are the orthogonal, you know, basically they are lines orthogonal to the first principal subspace. Now, if you try somehow, if you, if you knew the phi of x, right, if you knew phi of x, and you try to see how these lines look like in the original x space, you know these lines are not straight lines anymore. So we did linear PCA here, but the uh, principal component analysis doesn't look anything but linear when you look in the original x space. So that's the idea. The idea would be somehow, without having to explicitly construct phi, to, to do uh, uh, principal component analysis in some future space, all right? Uh, and, and hopefully we gain something in, uh, in the process. All right, let's see how we can do this in, in uh, uh, two slides, okay? I, uh, I realized this before coming, but you know, I had 10 slides and I said there's no way we can cover it, so two slides. So let's uh, remember the classical PCA, all right? So the data are centered. In the classical PCA, we have to compute uh, these, we have to solve an eigenvalue problem for the sample covariance. And I remind you, sample covariance is n transpose x transpose x. X is your uh, design metrics in, in uh, the input space x. Now I'm going to remind you what we did for the case that n is much less than the dimensionality of the problem. You remember we said uh, you can actually solve the problem 
not by doing an eigenvalue for x transpose x, by doing an eigenvalue instead of x x transpose. You remember that from the last lecture? So let's do the following thing. Let's solve the, uh, the eigenvalue problem from x x transpose. And let's call the matrix of the eigenvectors u and the eigenvalue matrix lambda. What's the dimensionality of x x transpose? What's the dimensionality of x x transpose? x, you remember every row of x, right, is one data point. So this should be uh, n by n. Right? So we're going basically, uh, let's say the original dimensionality of x was d, we go from uh, uh, d by d to x by x. Okay? So, uh, which fits nicely because, you know, we want to invert things of the order of, uh, you know, n by n, you know, uh, inversions, assuming that n is less than d. So, assuming that this is a cheaper problem to do, right? So n is less than d. So I do the eigenvalue problem. And then, you know what? I uh, pre-multiply with x transpose. So I put an x transpose there, an x transpose there. And then immediately you can see that x transpose u is the eigenvector matrix of what? Of the sample covariance. So basically, if you want to find the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of this, what actually you need to do is find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of x, x transpose, which is cheaper if n is less than d. And in that case, uh, the only thing you have to worry is, right, uh, if this vector x transpose u, uh, you normalize them basically, you need to uh, adjust basically for the normalization factor when you compute the eigenvalues of the sample covariance. And this is what I have done here. So the uh, eigenvectors of the sample covariance, which is what we care for PCA, will now be x transpose u, but also scaled with lambda to minus one half. All right, scaled to lambda minus one half uh, to be sure that this uh, 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 the vectors that the eigenvectors that we get here are normalized. All right, I mean the vectors u were normalized, and when you go from u to v, you have to normalize them again, and you factor the, you put lambda to minus one half, and there is the normalization. So let me repeat again. This is not kernel PCA yet. This is standard PCA. All right. In the, we want to do an eigenvalue problem for x transpose x. Instead, we solve the easier problem x x transpose. We compute the eigenvectors u and eigenvalues lambda. These are matrices, right? I put all together. And then, when you want to find uh, the normalized uh, eigenvectors for the sample covariance, basically is x transpose u lambda to minus one half. And of course, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, you say I want to use uh, 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 five eigenvectors, you just truncate u basically, and, and still the VPCA will have an expression that looks like that. Okay, where is kernel PCA coming? Uh, let's do the same trick now, uh, but somehow we are going to assume conceptually that the space X has been mapped to some future space phi, okay? So uh, we're going to start actually, instead of uh, future space, we're going to start directly with the Gramian matrix. Would you agree with me that, you remember here we use XX transpose. Do you agree with me that KXX transpose, uh, it is uh, a, seven, it's a post definite matrix? I mean, if you start with basis functions, you will see immediately that this involves only inner product of basis functions, but I don't need this, right? So k is uh, a Gramian uh, matrix, right? k is equal to xx transpose. So, uh, uh, the, so, so implicitly, all right, there is a corresponding future map because this is a Mercer kernel. So there is a map really to get this. It's like there is a map from x to phi of x, okay, that you see here. So what I do is I call phi the design matrix in future space. So capital phi is the design matrix in future space. So every row 
of the capital fee is what? It's one input point mapped in the future space. Okay? Remember, I don't want at the end of the day explicitly to have this function fee, right? But conceptually, this implies a fee because I told you that's the, the theorem, the Mercer theorem. So phi is the corresponding design matrix, okay? And uh, this is the sample covariance actually, all right, in the future space. So to get the item, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply the trick that we discussed here to the future space now, all right? So uh, would you agree with me, looking at this equation here, the normalized eigenvectors of the sample covariance were x transpose u lambda minus one half. Can you tell me, looking at this equation, how would this look like, like when I try to extend it to future specs? Instead of x, what do I suppose to have there? Capital phi. And instead of u, I am going to have the eigenvectors, but it, not of uh, x transpose x, but of phi transpose phi. And what is phi transpose phi? You know what it will give me? That's the kernel. The kernel matrix, the Gramian matrix. So basically, the uh, V, you know, the eigenvectors for the kernel PCA is phi transpose u lambda minus uh, one half, right? Uh, and this, the u and lambda are the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of this Gramian matrix K, right? Now, when you look at this expression, right, it uh, uh, looks sort of uh, uh, not very friendly because the dimensionality of this vector's phi can be infinite, right? So uh, even though this matrix is n by n, but phi, all right, can be an infinite dimensional vector. So the question is, you know, I mean, we're not going to be able to do calculations with infinite dimensional vectors. So what happens, you know, when we do PCA, we want to be able to do uh, projections of new points. So let's see what the algebra looks like. If you take a new point x star and you want to do kernel PCA, you want to project it in the future space. In the, you want to project it in the principal space where you did PCA, and that's the future space. So instead of doing projection of x, let's say the new point is x star, you're going to map it first to future space, phi star, and then you're going to do your linear PCA in the future space. So you're going to have phi star times this matrix phi, this matrix V. You plug in this matrix there, and you can immediately see actually that capital phi disappears because what you will be getting here is you will get this uh, kernel vector that involves only evaluating the kernel at x star, x1, x star, xn, etc. Okay, so we're basically done, all right? Practically done, okay? Uh, uh, so this is, uh, the idea is do PCA in the future space. That does not require that you know phi because the only thing you need is to have this Gramian matrix K. And then when you want to do new projections, uh, the, uh, uh, basically the kernel values are the only things that you need. There is a problem now that you haven't uh, seen yet. Remember to do PCA, uh, what did we assume for the data when we start with the sample covariance matrix? Right, I mean, everything you have seen, right, is uh, in, even in your classical PCA, when I wrote x transpose x, what did we assume for x that the data are what? Centered. So if you take data that are centered in space x, would it be centered you think, in phi of x? The answer is absolutely not. Which means the algorithm actually will not apply, will not, you cannot use it because the data of of x will not be centered. So what do you do? Well, it's very simple, <coughs> right? So what you uh, need to do is, uh, let me just go directly to the whole thing is, uh, uh, you need to basically center this kernel matrix K and the algebra is in the slides. So if you, you can go backwards, you can pretend that you had these future maps and then uh, do the calculation and get rid of them. But basically everything I told you 
instead of doing an eigenvalue, an eigenvector problem for k, you do it for the center matrix uh, uh, curly k, okay? And uh, uh, this 1n is not the vector, it's a matrix that has all the elements are the same equal to 1 over n, okay? So, uh, so the algorithm actually literally looks to do kernel PCA, it's, uh, it, it looks like that. You, you design this uh, uh, metric show to do the centering. Uh, you compute uh, this Gramian matrix K and you center it, let me see here. You solve the eigenvalue problem for K curly there. Uh, then you have to go back to the original eigenvectors of the sample covariance matrix in future space. So you have to normalize those use with the square roots of the eigenvalues. And then effectively, uh, you're done, all right? So if you want now to uh, compute the projections in uh, the PCA space of uh, uh, new points, effectively what you need to do is uh, this k star involves the new points x star where you want to do projections and involves the training data uh, n. So you have to compute this centered matrix k and then effectively this matrix times uh, this uh, matrix of eigenvectors V that is truncated, right? How many eigenvalues, eigenvectors you want to use uh, does the job, okay? Uh, so that's kernel PCA. The idea is do regular PCA in future space. The only thing you need is not future functions or anything like that. The only thing that you need is uh, to work with the Gramian matrix. So, uh, and there are some results in the notes and there is uh, if I have one second and the light doesn't go off, there is a, an issue with kernel PCA that makes it not a very useful method for many problems. If you try to